John, chapter number one, verse one. John one one. Gospel of John, chapter one, and verse one. The apostle says, "In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God." Father. I pray that you'd anoint this messenger, and I pray that you'd anoint your word as it goes forth. It will not return unto you void, but it will accomplish that which you please, and it will prosper in the thing whereto you've sent it. In your holy name I pray, amen. You can be seated. As you all know and heard me say time and time and time again, the Gospel of John's different. It's not the same as Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Although they're talking about the same one, it has its purpose. Each one does. Matthew is the gospel of the king, and it has a genealogy, and it finishes in that genealogy with Joseph, the stepfather of our Lord Jesus. Luke has a genealogy because it's talking about the man, and it finishes with a genealogy that's talking about Mary, because Mary is the mother of Christ. Mark has no genealogy, simply goes right in, and he's the servant of the Lord. Time and time and time and time again, it records what he does. But John has a genealogy. Here it is. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In other words, he goes back into eternity. That sets the stage for what you are going to be reading. Because he wants you to understand that the Gospel of John is high, lofty, and lifted up. And looks at things in that manner. It's written to Gentiles, as well as Jews. It's not written to the kingdom of heaven. It's written to you that are alive right now. So that you can understand the great truths that are recorded here. The Bible said the word was in the beginning. John calls the Lord Jesus Christ the Lagos. He's the word. He's referring to him as this because he is the brilliant one. He is the one who speaks from his wisdom and creates. Not only that, but the apostle said in the book of Hebrews, God who at uh, sundry times in divers manners spake in the fathers in time past, hath now in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. The Lord Jesus Christ is the consummation of the revelation of God. It gets no greater than him. So we find the word, and we understand that because everything that follows and everything in your Christian life is dependent upon who the Lord Jesus Christ is. If we get him wrong, none of the rest of it matters. To get him right is salvation. And to know him right. He says in John chapter number 6, I'm the bread of life. And that he is the bread of life because he's the sustainer of life. He gave, gives you life. He sustains your life. The scripture says he upholds all things by the word of his power. They get into these uh, atomic uh, thing, you know, they break it down, this and that and so forth. They wonder what holds it together. And if they can split an atom of such a small magnitude, they have an unbelievable amount of power that is released in that. Why? Because there's one holding all of this together. So in the Bible says in John chapter number 8 and verse 12, Then spake Jesus unto them, saying, I'm the light of the world. And yes, he is. If you don't have him, you're walking in darkness today. Because there's no, dark, there's no light outside of him. John 1 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Still doesn't. Still doesn't know the light when it sees it. Still rejects the light. The Bible says in John 3.19, this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. I want you to pay special attention, condemnation. This is the condemnation. It means that this is the way that God judges every living human being on the face of this earth. What do you do with the light that comes to you? You can turn away from it. You can try to hide from it. You can try to overcome it. You can try to cover it up. But the truth of the matter is, He's the light that lighteth every man that cometh into this world. We have no excuse because you're sitting under the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ right now. And my friend, things are said from this pulpit that you don't hear in this country and other pulpits, not just this one. Faithful men of God are preaching 
in churches all over America. But for the most part, most of the preachers in this country have become apostate now and they've turned away from the truth. So they don't like the light. John 8, 12 said, Then spake Jesus unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. If your life is a total waste, nothing but one sorrow and one problem after another, maybe it's because you're not walking in the light. And the only way that you can walk in the light is to walk in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all. That's the only way. There is no light outside of that. You're going to scratch and claw and try this, try that, and you'll never find the truth of the way of God until you walk in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you'll walk in fellowship with Christ, you'll walk in fellowship with the Father. Where is he, preacher? He standeth at the door and knocketh. If any man will open that door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. That's where he is. Knocking on your heart's door today. And you're the only one that can open it. And it's up to you to open it and it's up to you to shut it. Do you open it this morning? Why don't you open it? Why don't you try something today that you've tried everything else? Why don't you try walking in fellowship with Christ? Say, how do I do that, preacher? Just invite him in. Invite him into your life and he, my friend, will come in. The Bible says in John chapter number 12, Jesus cried and said, now listen carefully to this, John 12, 44, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. Let me explain that. There is no way you can believe in God and not believe in Christ. And if you believe in Christ, you're going to believe in God. For they're inseparable. They're one and the same. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost make up the Godhead. Notice what he said. Verse 46. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. Boy, I spent 27 years in darkness. I mean, I stumbled. I mean, I fell. I scratched. I clawed. I tried this. I tried that. Until the light came to my soul. Listen to what one man said about this text. Notice carefully. Whosoever believeth in me should not abide in darkness. He said he kept on bringing them back to light and darkness. At the end of life's journey, it is either one or the other. To go out into a light beyond the brightness of the noonday sun. And to bask in that light forever. Eternally entering into more and more of God's wisdom, power and love. In ever expanding horizons and dimensions of bliss. Or to go out into the horror of great darkness. The blackness of eternal doom. I listened the other day about one of the big producers in this country. Billionaire, multi, multi. Million. He's got more money than he could ever spend. But he's dying. He's coming down to the end of his life. And he's the most depressed man in this country. He says, I've got to give this stuff up. He said, I have to give it to somebody. And he said, look where I am. There's nothing left. And I thought to myself, that's what he has to offer you, dear friend. Without the Lord Jesus Christ, when it comes time to die, and you will, you'll have nothing left. It's easy today when you're young and strong. It's easy today to say you don't need God. It's easy to live your life. Young married couples got your children. Keep yourself occupied with what you're doing. But the truth of the matter is, in just a few short years, you'll be where I am. I was where you are at one time. You'll be where I am. Sooner than you think. Let me tell you something. The future is bright. I leave this world with total brightness, glory in my soul. Make no mistake about it, I got that settled a long time ago. I know in whom I have believed. I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I commit to him against that day. The Bible says I am now ready to be offered in the time of my departures at hand. I've fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished my course. And I want to do that. Of all the things that I do on this earth, I want to finish my course. God left me here for a reason. I want to finish that course. And then when he gets done with me, I want him to take me home. And I'll say, I'll meet you by the river. How many like to meet me by the river? Oh, yes, we'll meet by the river. 
Say, where's the river preacher flowing from the throne of God? That's where it is. And oh my, what singing and what glory and what joy and what praise and what peace and what a home that we have in heaven. It's ours and cannot be taken away from us. Oh, I don't have the money he's got. But I'll tell you something right now. I'm richer by far than he ever thought of being. He can take all of his millions and he can't buy one moment of peace. He can't buy it, folks. He showed a photograph of his face the other day and man alive. He had this horrible look on his face like somebody looking off into the abyss of darkness where there's no hope. And I thought, my, 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 look what you've got to offer the young people. Why don't you tell them what a fool you've made out of yourself and what a fool you've made out of your life when you come down to the end of your days. You remember the Old Testament when he said, I envied the wicked, I envied them until I went into the tabernacle of God. And he said, when I went into the tabernacle of God, I saw their end. Changed his attitude completely. There will be an end. So, the Bible calls him the shepherd in John chapter number 10, verse 11. He said, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. That nothing a shepherd could do greater than that. And when the bear and when the wolf and when the lion and when the tiger, whatever it is, is coming after the sheep, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour, the Lord Jesus Christ laid his life down for the sheep. Amen. Now that death is not just an event. That death means something. For when Christ died, he died for the ungodly. When Christ died, he died that we could live. There is no greater death than the death of the Son of God. All deaths must be judged by the death of the greatest one that ever lived. And he's the good shepherd that gave his life for the sheep. Moses was the shepherd. He led the people to freedom. David was the shepherd. He led the people to a kingdom. The shepherds were the first to be called to the birth of Christ, the lowly shepherd in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. We just read that, didn't we? We came through the Christmas season, and the angel of the Lord's the angels appeared to them and said, This day in the city of David is born a king, which is Christ the Lord. And they said, Come, let us see this great thing. And they left, and they went, and they found the babe. Lying in a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes. And there was Mary and Joseph. And so the first ones that God called on this earth to come and see the birth of Christ was the lowly shepherd. The Bible tells us that in the book of Zechariah, chapter number 11, verse 17, look at the idle shepherd. Look what it says. Woe to the I-D-O-L. How do you spell idle if you're talking about somebody not doing anything? I-D-L-E. That's idle, that's idleness, that's, that's cessation of work or whatever. But I-D-O-L, what does that mean? What does that spell? It spells some kind of a God, some kind of a thing that's worshipped, some kind of a thing like that. And notice in Zechariah when it talks about this shepherd. It says in Zechariah 11 verse 17, Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. His sword, the sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. There's an awful lot to say about this idle shepherd. This is the Antichrist. And the, the apostle told us in the book of 1 Thessalonians that he would consume him with the brightness of his coming. He can't stand the light, folks. That's why the darkness calls them at night and they come, out like, they come out like roaches at night and they walk the streets, they go to the bars here and there. It's nighttime, that's what they want because their whole life is darkened. There's no light in them. Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. Amen. I want to come to the music. I want to come to the preaching. I want to come to the grace of God. I want to come to the saints. I want to come to where the Holy Ghost is moving in the midst of the people. Spare me from the darkness and let me come to where God's people are. So he's the idle shepherd. In Hebrews chapter 13 verse 20 it says, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Notice the good shepherd is connected to death. The good shepherd dies. The Lord Jesus Christ said, No man takes my life. I lay it down freely. But notice carefully the apostle in Hebrews says, The great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Notice that he's called the great shepherd because the contrast of the blood. 
greater than Moses, greater than David, greater than the shepherds in the field. There is no shepherd in the Bible greater than the Lord Jesus Christ. He's greater than all of them. And one of the great themes of the book of Hebrews is the greatness of Christ, the betterness, how He's better. The Lord Jesus, better offerings, better sacrifices, and walk with God because He is the great shepherd. Hallelujah to God. How? Because of the blood of the everlasting covenant. I can't see the blood, but I believe in it. And if you'll believe in the blood today, it'll cover your sins. If you'll believe in something you can't see, the apostle says in the book of Hebrews chapter number 11, believing, trusting in Him that is invisible. And that's who we believe in today. I've never seen God with these natural eyes, but I know He's there as surely as I breathe. 1 Peter chapter number 5 and verse 4 says this, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Now the good shepherd is associated with death. And the great shepherd is associated with the blood covenant. And now the chief shepherd is associated with the second coming. When he shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Come, Lord Jesus, come. After God had showed John all of that in the book of Revelation, all he could say was, come, come back, Lord Jesus, come. Well, preacher, aren't we supposed to save the world? No. Aren't we supposed to make the world a better place in? I'll do what I can to help humanity. I want to feed the babies, take care of the children. If they can, if they can do something in medical science that will help you, I'm all for it. I'm for anything that will alleviate the suffering and sorrow of this world. But change it? No, my dear friend, because it's under a curse. This is why we look for that one who's been cursed and the curse can no longer touch him. He's been dead, but death can no longer touch him. He came to destroy the power of the devil. And he did because the devil threw everything he had against him. He put him on a cross. Everything Satan could do. And the Lord Jesus Christ was victorious over him. Over death, hell, and the grave. Folks, once the law has been exhausted, once it's done everything it can do, it can't do any more to you. And the Lord Jesus said, now because I live, you shall live also. Amen. He is the chief shepherd. And when he shall appear, he'll appear. If you ever read the Song of Solomon, it reads over there about the third or fourth chapter of the Song of Solomon. It talks about how he looks through the lattice work. And there's my beloved looking through the lattice work. He said, it is the spring of the year because the row and the hind are moving across the fields. The flowers are blooming. They're singing in the field. And I see my beloved. What's that preacher? That's a picture of the church looking at the second coming. And the idea is this. That when the Lord Jesus comes to get us. That he may appear just long enough. When we hear that voice. That we look up. <laughs> Man. Now that fellow working next to you. Unsay he didn't have a clue. He didn't hear anything. He didn't know anything. He just goes about his day as he always has. But for you that look for him, shall he appear the second time without sin into salvation? They stood outside the day of atonement, Yom Kippur. Israel would stand outside waiting for the high priest to come back out. Because he had gone before God, he carried the sins of the people, the breastplate and the epaulets on his shoulder. He walked before the Almighty. He stood there. They say he had bells on the bottom of his, of, of his coat because sometimes he didn't walk back out. That they had to be able to, if they hear the bell, they reached in there. They couldn't go in and get him because the same glory that killed him would kill you. So they pulled him out. So they stood outside and they waited for the high priest. And the high priest, the sins were taken, put forward another year. Then God pronounced the blessing on the high priest. He blessed the people through the high priest. He would turn around. He would walk back out. He would appear to the people. They were all standing outside, bated breath. They didn't know what to expect. And the high priest would raise his hands and pronounce the blessing on the people. They that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. They were standing outside looking for the priest to come. And when he came, they were there to see him as he appeared before them and they received the blessing. Are you looking for his appearing or are you caught up in this world? 
let you know if you're born again. If you're truly a born again believer, you're not looking out. You're not looking down. You're looking up. You don't want to look in. There's problem. You don't want to look down. You know what's down there. You want to look around. You got all kinds of problem. Look up. Amen. Lift up thy head. Thy redemption draweth nigh. Amen. Our citizenship is where? It's in heaven. Amen. So he's called the chief shepherd. John 11 verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection, the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Now we get into personifications here. What's that mean? A personification means that you take a thing like resurrection, a thing like love, a thing like faith, and a person becomes that. What's that mean? It means that anything the Lord Jesus Christ says is the word of God because he's the word of God. It means that when He appears, that's the word there standing in you. That means His presence is God speaking to you. You understand that the, the communication and the word from God can come in a lot of different ways. Never man spake like this man, they said. No, they hadn't. They couldn't because there's only one Lord Jesus Christ. So when He says, I'm the resurrection, He doesn't say that the resurrection is a time and a place. He says the resurrection is a person. In 1973, when I got saved, I was raised from the dead. <laughs> I've been I've already been raised from the dead. What are you talking about, preacher? He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. But he said, You hath he quickened who were what? Dead in trespasses and sin. You see, I was raised from spiritual death. Hallelujah. That resurrection was as sure as I stand before you. I am the resurrection and the life. John 14, he said, Jesus said to him, I'm the way, the truth. And the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's beautiful, isn't it? Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how we know the way. Thomas, here's the answer. I am the way, the truth, and the life. In the book of John, chapter 15, this gets interesting. Verse 1. John 15, verse 1. The Lord said, I am the true vine, and my father's the husbandman. Well, why does he say that? He says that in contradistinction to a false vine, to a vine of poison. The Deuteronomy 32 verse 33 says this, Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asp, and they have drunk it to its dregs. They're drinking it right now. But he said, I'm the true vine, and my father's the husbandman. Look at John chapter number 2 and verse 1. The third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. The Apostle John records all of these miracles in the Gospel of John. And he calls them signs. They're signs. They're sign miracles. Well, what's a sign? It's got a message in it. He even counts the day or he counts the number of them. Notice what he says in verse number. This third day... There was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Did you know that before the Lord Jesus Christ came, man was here for 4,000 years? Did you know that after the Lord Jesus Christ went back to glory, that two of those thousand years have passed, and we're looking at the third thousand years? Did you know that in the Bible, the number seven, so many times is broken up into four and three? Four and three. There's a reason for that. There's a reason for it. Four and three. You see, the Lord Jesus is going to come back and there's going to be a marriage supper of the Lamb. No, there will. There'll be a marriage supper. And when we, is that preacher? Third day. Because you're living, getting ready for that third day. Look at the book of Hosea. Chapter number six and verse number one. Hosea chapter number 6 and verse 1. Hosea, which is another Hebrew word for salvation, Savior, Hosea, Hosea. Come and let us reason together. Come and let us return to the Lord. For he hath torn, he will heal us. He hath smitten, he will bind us up. Now watch this verse 2. After two days will he revive us. In the what? In the third day he will raise us up. And we shall live in his sight. Who are we? Israel. Israel. The millennium, which is coming, folks, 
is coming for Israel to become the head of all the nations again. I don't care how much you try to blow the Jews up and wipe them from the face of the earth, you're not going to do it. They're the ancient people and the Bible's full of prophecies about their return and about the time when God will elevate them above all the nations and you're going to do it. And you can't do anything about that. If, you, if you're a Jew hater today, I'll just, I feel sorry for you. Tough luck. <laughs> because I love them. They gave me the Bible. Now, don't you look at this carefully now. Look at it. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. This four, three, third day. I want you to look at something now. Go back to the book of Genesis. Genesis. Let me get my reference here. All right, look at Genesis. Chapter 2, verse 21. Genesis 2, every sheep in the beginning, the beginning, the beginning, Genesis 2, verse 21, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman. The man is an ish, Hebrew, the woman is an ishah. Hebrew. One is masculine, the other is feminine. Right off the bat, we realize that when God made man, man's a man. Then he made the woman, woman's a woman. The Lord never got confused about it. He knew exactly what he was doing. Amen. No gender fluidity, you know. And he made the man the woman, brought her to the man, and Adam said, now watch this, verse 23. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. You know what you just read here in the book of Genesis? That's a wedding. That's a marriage. It's a marriage. It's when the man and the woman were united together. And who performed the first marriage ceremony? Well, the Lord did. You reckon he's qualified to do that? I believe he is. Don't you? He's qualified. Note carefully now. What day was the man made on? Six, we're in the seventh day. We're in the seventh day, and we've got a wedding taking place. Over here in the book of John, we're on the third day. The third day comes after the four days. Four and three is seven. See what I mean? Here we have a beautiful picture of the, of the marriage of the Lamb. When he will come for his bride. When does he come for it? In the seventh day. How do you know that? We're done with six of them. We're looking at the seventh now. And he's going to come and get us. And he's going to catch us up to meet him in the clouds. And we're going to be with him forevermore. Amen. I want you to notice something else about this that I think is a beautiful thing. This beginning of miracles, John says, they're in Canaan of Galilee. Just a little old place. I've been over there. Just a little place. Beautiful though. Everything, everything in the Holy Land is beautiful. Rocks are beautiful. Trees are beautiful. Roads are beautiful. Be food's beautiful. Everything's beautiful. Because I love the Holy Land. Note carefully. They invited him to this wedding. He's not a wedding crasher, is he? Note carefully. They invited him to this wedding. You know what? I believe an awful lot of weddings today would do a whole lot better if you'd invite him to your wedding. Amen. They invited him to the wedding. And of course, he took up their invitation. There he was. Man, there's something beautiful about that. It doesn't tell you who they were, but it doesn't matter who they were. The guest of honor was the Lord Jesus. And then finally, in John chapter number 8 and verse 58, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say to you, before Abraham was, I was. Messed up, didn't I? How many of you caught me? All right. What's it say? Before Abraham was what? I am. That's the eternal present tense. That's what that means. And over here in the book of Exodus, he told him in chapter number 3, verse 14, God said to Moses, Oh, they want to know who I am? They want to know my name? All right. You tell them this. 
John chapter number 3, verse 14. God said to Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel, I am hath sent me. When I get sock, Isaac means laughter. All right? Jacob means usurper. All these names have a distinct meaning because they identify the individual. You know what that word is? Haya. That's the Hebrew word. Haya. Haya. That's exactly the word. And you know what it means? It means to exist. I exist whether you exist or not. I'm here whether anything else is here or not. I can't wrap my mind around that part. Honestly, I'm serious as I can be. I cannot comprehend an eternal being that has never ceased to be. I believe it. But how far back will you let your mind go? He's eternal. Forever. He's the eternal existing one. You tell Israel my name. Is Haya. I am that I am. He's the self existing one. He's the eternal one. He's the all sufficient one. He's the all knowing one. He's the creator and sustainer of all creation. And thank God he's the redeemer and savior. Amen. I am that I am. Moses, shock. You're talking to the great I am. Moses had access to God. That not another soul in that Old Testament had. He did. You just look at the life of Moses. He was able to come into the presence of the Lord in a way nobody else could. Moses could do it. He said, well, the rest of you, he said, you come this way or that way. But Moses, he said, I'll speak face to face. The Bible said the children of Israel saw his acts. They saw what he was doing. But he showed Moses his ways. Moses knew his way. In other words, he knew the mind and the will and the purpose behind what was happening. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing in our lives if we knew his way? You're not just a piece. You're not, you're not, you're not a straw blowing in the wind. You're not, you know, you're not some bubble out here that's just blowing around. You ever seen the foam on the sea? When the water on the, on the sea, the ocean comes up against the beach. Sometimes it'll foam up. You ever seen the wind will come along and just blow it away? It's just gone. A lot of people think that's all your life is about. You're just here and you have no reason to be here and there's nothing to live for and there's no purpose in it. I'm going to tell you something right now. Of all the people that have ever lived, and there are billions of them, and alive at this moment, there are over 7 billion people. And how many live in the future? I have no idea, but I'm going to tell you something. Not a one of them, not a single one of them, is identical to you. You are an individual. You are an individual. Yes, you are. You are an individual. And he loves you. He loves you like you wouldn't believe. He loves you. He loves you because he made you. You came out of the womb the way you are because God brought you out of that womb the way you are. And I'll close with this. Millions of spermatozoa try to get to that egg. You understand biology a little bit, you know? Millions. But only one can fertilize the egg. Yeah. And on the way to the egg, on the way to the egg, there are pitfalls. In the, all over the place, grabs a handful of, of spermatozoa, kills the spermatozoa. The, directed over here, the spermatozoa died. What starts out as millions winds up as hundreds. And then finally, one. One spermatozoa fertilizes that egg. And once that egg is fertilized, it begins to divide, 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 divide. You understand all that? You are one in a million. Think about what you are and why you're here. You're one. You're one in a million. Why don't you give your life to the Lord Jesus this morning? Say, thank you, Lord. Thank you that I exist. I mean, I, could, I exist. I didn't consciously do anything to exist. Did you? Nothing. I exist because he exists. Father, in Jesus' name, bless your word now. Bless it to the hearing of the people. 
If somebody in this house today heard something, it may stir them. It may stir their heart. It may stir their mind. It may, it may get a hold of them. It may cause them to think. It may begin to move them toward you in your direction. If that's what happens, I'm happy. I'm, I'm happy. I'm well, I'm well satisfied with that. If they just heard something today that got their attention and caused them to think, I'm happy. There may be somebody in the house today, though that's happened some time ago, and now they're at a point this morning where they have to make a decision, got to make a choice, because they know you've been working on their heart and you've been dealing with them, and they know that it's time now to do something about it. If that's the case, then I pray for them. I pray they'll make that right decision. I'll pray they'll choose Christ and not Satan, not the enemy, not darkness, not the devil. I pray this in Jesus' name. Somebody in this house today, they carried burdens in here, too many for anybody to carry. They want to die. The burden's too low, heavy. This world is full of burdens. It's full of sorrow. But Lord Jesus, you bore all of that in your body at the cross. You bore it. I pray for them that they'd come to Calvary and they cast their care before you for you care for them. In Jesus' name I pray. For Jesus' sake I ask it.